Okie doke. This talk is called Simple System Testing with Roundup and Ansible. My name is Peter Hollands. And um, who am I? I'm going to make this really short more to explain my, my point of view in this talk. Um, strictly speaking, I'm a developer. By now primarily Python, in the past also C and, and other things no one wants to mention, like PHP. Um, but I've also been in IT support for in, back in, in, in really, really old times for three years. I've been a senior intern at SUSE Consulting for nine years. Senior because I shamelessly promoted myself to senior. Um, and I've been a Linux system engineer at the German air traffic control. That's the guys um, in charge of those towers at the airports. And I'm also freelancing since over 15 years. Um, the point of this slide is to point out that uh, I don't have the one perspective or the other. <laughs> but I somehow can't decide uh, which camp I want to take on. And uh, that's also uh, part of the reason why I get, keep getting stupid DevOps proposals. Uh, yeah, you know that. Recruiters. Well, that's good. Um, my story goes like this. I don't need much IT for my needs, but I do need some. For example, file server and, and mail service. That's pretty old school, I guess. Uh, I run IT mostly on my own for reasons. And I don't do admin work often enough, uh, and I don't want to either. Um, which means I keep forgetting things, keep forgetting how to do this, how to do that. And that's actually my motivation to have gone into contract management and, and automate things, even with, uh, if it's just for a single system or two systems or whatever. Because I believe infrastructure as code, done right, sort of documents itself. This is, of course, a very broad claim, but in my case, it's actually true. So I began with Ansible, but I switched to uh, bullshit. I began with Puppet and switched to Ansible. Um, I wrote my own Ansible roles like everyone else. As we know, uh, code we use on uh, Ansible Galaxy, uh, <coughs> yeah, ask JP about it. Um, I actually realized I didn't always know when I'd be finished with writing a role. You know, like, like, like if, you, if, if you begin, of course, you install the package and you set up this file and that file. But actually, I, I, no I noticed, I, I, I actually had to think about when I was done. I mean, you could say, of course, when the server is working, but, but there's many details in, in, in whatever you're trying to configure. In my case, it was a mail server. So um, <laughs> I wasn't really always sure. And that makes the point that we all probably know config management is making explicit the things we otherwise would do manually. And it requires me to think and reflect about intent and desired state. And these two points, no, wrong one. Uh, these two points are quite important with respect to this talk. Because, here's the first meme, um, everyone knows the girl, my contract management code guarantees we reach the desired state, right? Well, the official Ansible documentation has a, I would say, um, misguiding um, approach towards um, state on the one side and the state, the actual state of the system on the other side. Um, for example, it has points such as, uh, well, this is a, these are models of desired state. Oh yeah, it's a bit, um, can you read it from the back? Or is it too, okay. So it says, for example, Ansible resources are models of desired state. As such, it should not be necessary that services, uh, to test that services are started, pa packages are installed, or other such things, because Ansible will magically ensure that. And then it goes on, and for example, it says, well, there's a minus minus check mode that you could use as a layer testing. Yes? But this is about test strategies, eh? Correct. And I think this is written for written if you create tests for the modules and other stuff? No. No? No. No, this is verbatim from the, from the documentation and it has no, no restriction towards uh, modules or whatsoever. Th this is just general statements that I found in the documentation. Um, and it goes on, for example, with, with uh, I have to get used to this thing. Um, Ansible believes you should not need another framework to validate basic things of your infrastructure is true. Um, you should not need another framework. We're coming back to that eventually. Um, and Ansible is an auto-based system that will fail immediately for unhandled errors, etc., etc. 
in the final sentence, the focus shouldn't be on infrastructure <coughs> testing, but instead on application testing. So, um, my main problem with that is your intent as a sysadmin, or an SRE, or whatever it's called these days, is not necessarily the end result. Um, of course, we have Ansible modules, roles, and playbooks uh, um, that we all, well, not playbooks, but modules and roles that certainly got battle tested to some point, but that's not my point here. Um, my point here is, and it's probably nothing new, um, my original intent and the outcome, the execution, these are two things. Um, code is expression of intent, nothing new, and of course we can battle test that, but there is no automatic test that tells me, oh, you've forgotten this aspect or this aspect. Yeah? Say, for example, um, I configure my mail server, and um, primarily I would want to, I don't know, set up aliases, uh, set up mailboxes, whatever, but I wouldn't immediately, at least, I wouldn't, immediately think of the fact that I also want my TLS configuration to be battle-proof. To, uh, to try to get an A-plus rating on SSL apps or whatever. Um, for example. <laughs> but in my opinion, um, it helps, of course, and that's one of the reasons why software developers do TDD and all this stuff. Um, of course, we cannot anticipate what we are forgetting, but we can try to at least actively think about it and try to write really, really uh, uh, tests, you know, like, like um, from, from the perspective what do I want to achieve and not, not the how? And in my point of view, just writing a, place, uh, a, a playbook is more about the how and not about the what. So, testing all the things is nothing new. Modern admins, DevOps, SREs, IT gods, whatever, have adopted um, developer methodologies. That's nothing new. We have um, seen some talk about... Shit, wonky. Uh, about this guy, everyone knows this guy, right? Jenkins. Um, so you're all probably already doing version control, continuous integration, deployment, containers, and automated testing, and I don't know what. But um, the point I want to try to, um, to make at this talk is what's the subject and the scope of a test? Because testing is a wide field. So the next thing is something I just picked up by some guy who, who differentiates between auto-manual tests, may, meaning you write tests manually and then they run automatically versus generative tests which um, are supposed to be uh, generated to such an extent that every possible input combination is being tested for example. And you have unit tests, integration tests, exemptions tests and whatever. Um, we could do playbook syntax testing and we could do role testing and that's something that Tom will address later on. I won't in this talk because um, here I care about system testing, and system testing, to, to, to put it apart from, from um, for example, Ton's talk, um, if I test a role, um, well, that gives me a good feeling about the role itself, but not automatically, at least in my opinion, about the state of a particular installed system. Of course, towards the, the, the intent of the role, whatever that role does, you could see, well, of course, if this role works, this aspect of the system will work, especially as designed in the role. But as I said, intent is a bit broader than um, what I may have written down and what, uh, what I may, may have not written down. Um, my TLS example, for example. So what I want to do and what I propose is to, to augment, um, for example, your Ansible playbook, but it could be any config management language, with tests of the installed system. And frankly, uh, frankly speaking, I don't care if you call that unit tests or integration tests or acceptance tests. I don't care. Um, where do these run? Let's keep it simple on the installed system itself. Otherwise, you would have to care with, I don't know, SSH connections. And if you're testing for ports with firewalls, rules, and whatever. And we could use Python for that. We could Ruby and Node. And I don't know what. Sophisticated testing frameworks. Or we could use Ansible again. Because um, Ansible itself proposes some um, mechanisms, and oh, I, I, say, I think these are modules actually, right? Wait for, I guess it's a plugins. or plugins or whatever. So you can you, you can do this. It's nice. Uh, nobody can read it, but um, 
you can do something like this. You can use wait for and, wa and fail and assert and scripts and um, do some tests. For example, you could use the action plugin. This is actually from the official page. And just try to access that uh, URI and see if you get an answer. And otherwise, you fail. So you get immediate uh, feedback in your playbook about whether that URI has been made available or not. Could do this, and it doesn't hurt. But um, I've been thinking about whether it makes sense or whether it's completely natural to write the tests in the same programming language that I wrote the implementation in. In this case, um, Ansible. And I would say, well, yes. There are cases where it's absolutely natural. For example, if I write a Django application, my test I would write in Python as well. But in this case, um, because I'm talking about a system, um, and if I think about what, what primarily concerns me, and that is in the end, um, because we're talking about service mostly here, these are interactions that the end user will have. So for example, with a mail server, my typical interaction is uh, checking for mail, sending mail. And in my opinion, an Ansible playbook is maybe not the right place to, to, to test for these or to, to model these interactions. So now comes the, the first controversial slide, if I say bash. And then we see a lot of those memes here. I want to script in bash, bam, nope, use Python. And oh, another bash script and whatever. And we have all seen this. So here's an example for a system test as a bash script, which is, again, not really readable, but I hope you can at least identify parts of it. First of all, we run bash with minus x minus e. I assume everyone knows what that means. And I could write the first simple test is, in this case, postfix actually installed, test minus x. Simple as that. This test will fail if the binary is not existent, and otherwise it will continue. Then I could uh, check if a certain process of postfix is running. And here it gets a bit fancier, because it's not just those uh, um, um, primitive things I can do. Um, <laughs> if I want to actually validate the, the TLS setup, well, OpenSSL is readily available on most systems, I would assume. Otherwise, I could just install it. And OpenSSL wouldn't really hurt, I guess. So I can use the S client and just connect to my local host and install my TLS. And um, I grabbed for a certain output that tells me, yes, start TLS is working. And because I'm nice, I'm also sending the quit command, so connection gets closed again. Actually, not only because I'm nice, but uh, because OpenSSL S client behaves a bit different from Netcat. And to go on, um, well, a simple test here. I added another queue, so this test should fail. And because this test fails, this one would be never reached in this example. This is short, this is simple, it doesn't require a whole software stack. And the question is, can you do that in your whatever your favorite program language is? You, know, you could be proponent of any program language, I don't care. It's not that it's bad, but I think this is simple. So what would be the output here? Because it's bash minus x, I see every command being executed. Because it's uh, bash minus e, it exits at the first failure. Well, this does the job, but um, the output is not really um, easily understandable. Um, a failing test causes the entire test script to be aborted, which is not necessarily what I want to be to see. Maybe I just want this particular test to be skipped. And also, um, it gets kind of hard to try to, to uh, for example, if you have some more complex stuff, like you have to start this daemon, this daemon, this daemon, you want a preset, uh, a, a pretest setup function maybe to run. And you also want to tear down stuff. Um, we know that from, from for example, from uh, Python nose tests. And there's no isolation between the single tests. So, for example, if, if one of those tests would pollute the environment, it would actually pollute uh, the successive tests as well. Luckily, there is, um, I don't know, what do you call it in, in, in English? Uh, if you, uh, I think it's an asset this thing. Uh, kind of uh, controversially debated in the European Parliament uh, and um, yeah, wound up. Of course we're not going, literally, going to use literally this, but something called like this. And um, 
this is a little, well, I'll just quote it. A unit testing tool for running test plans which I've written in any POSIX shell. It lives on um, GitHub, written by a guy called Blake Mazzoni, which is apparently the author of Sinatra for Ruby. Not that I would know what uh, that is, but apparently that means he has some credit. And um, the nice thing is, oh, it's completely unreadable. Okay, I will try to make up for that. Um, Roundup itself is a best script, which only has like 107 lines of code and 307 lines in total that gives you an idea about how well commented it is. And it does use a lot of shell magic, which I actually wanted to highlight here, like it's using subshells here and it's doing fancy stuff here with redirects, etc. But I'm not, I don't really want to show the code here. Right? It's, it's just um, that the author apparently is quite proficient in uh, shell programming. So what does Roundup do? It's a wrapper. I just call it in a directory of so-called test plans, which actually are ordinary shell scripts. I can also give it a name of a single test plan to execute, so a name of a particular shell script. Um, Roundup sources this script and simply executes each test that I put in a separate function, which has to start with it. For example, I don't know, it lives, it runs, uh, it does what I want to do. And it simply runs each function after each other in an isolated sandbox fashion. So that means a subshell of its own with a clean environment. And the test output will, will be pass or fail. And in, if it fails, I will see standard error and standard out, which looks like this. Um, oh no, this is actually the script. If I took the previous script and we wrote it as a roundup test plan, um, these are the functions that, that, that begin with an it. For example, it has postfix installed. I just put my test in there. So I, I simply move these, these simple statements into functions of their own. Um, and suddenly, Roundup goes, and I have this kind of nice output, right? I have a pass, I have a pass, I have a fail, and if it fails, it, it shows me again the bash minus x output and any standard out or standard error that would um, occur there. Otherwise, uh, each test plan, I, can, I could give it uh, a description with this describe function that is actually so, uh, provided by Roundup itself. In that case, the output would read differently from the file name, so nothing, nothing magic. But an interesting thing is I can do um, pretest setup and post-test teardown in before and after functions. So if you want to start your three daemons, you just do it in the before function. And if you want to clean it up, you just do it in the after function. The after function is always called. So even if a test fails and goes completely wrong or whatever, you're supposed to get a clean environment. And that's it, right? This is all about Roundup. So basically, all I'm introducing you to do today is a, is a nice shell script or a shell script wrapper or so, right? What's with the bad parts? Um, last commit is a bit ago. Three open issues, well, that's not so much. 11 pull requests, well, for a simple shell script, right? where you really don't have to reason much. And some practical impacts. Um, I said you, could, you can give uh, um, um, names of test plans or of, of files, so you're restricted to file globbing. Everything, the, the bash can glob, that's all you can do with regard to test selection. There's nothing like feature flex or anything like that. Um, a test can't say, hey, skip me, because, I don't know, for example, uh, in Python I would probably put my LDAP tests in, 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 um, in something in, in it where, where every test would require the, the LDAP feature flag to be set. And that only then I would say I'm going to test LDAP as well and otherwise just skip this test. You can't do that with Roundup. There's no timing statistics, so you won't see how, how much time the tests took. Also, well, I said the guy is pretty proficient in bash programming, but before and after, if, if, if you work with subshells, there are some mm, issues that eventually um, strike you some time. I, I didn't hit them, but um, there are issues re related to that. And there's no programmatic test generation. Programmatic test generation referring to, um, I don't want to repeat myself all over if I have, for example, one test, but want to test it for, for 10 different things, 10 different input values, I would really have to write it down 10 times. Really? And there's 61 forks, so it makes it a bit hard um, to pick one. Actually, one of those forks 
is from my former employer at the ATC, we actually used Roundup. And we actually used Roundup to convince the QT paranoid uh, ATC engineers <coughs> Um, who tried to, to get us into discussions as to when an internally delivered product would be safe enough. And it, it really helps a lot psychologically if you, if you can just uh, log on to the system itself and want to test on the system itself. And if you see 10 times green, it's a totally different level of discussion, which is human, I guess. So it, it does have some bad parts, but it's usable enough for me. Um, there are some alternatives. I didn't look uh, all too much into it, most of all because Roundup works for me. But for example, there's a third uh, .sh, which is even easier than Roundup. You just source it in your test script and then you have a third function. But it doesn't do any isolation or, or um, setup and teardown. So it's really much more simple. There is sh unit 2, um, which is basically also sourced into it. It also has an assert function. And it even distinguishes between a one-type setup, which is a setup um, before all tests, and then a, a setup that gets called before each test individually. For example, I don't know, you want to clean up your SNMP uh, environment or whatever. Um, it does support skipping. It does support test suites. The problem is it looks inactive and there's multiple source wrappers, so I wouldn't immediately know um, which one to take. And then there's bets. Um, that, for example, this guy who actually uh, did, a, did the comparison of these tools in the end went for, um, which looks a bit strange to me because, first of all, it does use a custom suffix for its files because it's not, strictly speaking, a, a best script anymore. It has this strange syntax with the, with the add sign, add test description, and I don't know what. And apparently it's TEP compliant, which is apparently test anything protocol, which apparently is a big thing, but uh, I haven't heard about it before and apparently I don't need it, but it might be of use to someone. So there is some alternatives, if Roundup sucks in your eyes, you might have a look at, at those alternatives. So, Toshi, nice to see you here. Uh, because I took you as an example, suppose you wanted to verify your mail server installation. You, you wanted to verify that all those contact addresses you use, uh, email addresses uh, are working. And for example, um, you want to verify that info at lowdays.org is working, you want that contact at lowdays.org is working, and webmaster at lowdays.org, and it could go on like this, abuse, whatever. So you could write this test plan, which, as I said, is basically still a best script. And you could write a function, it lets Toshi receive mail for info at lowdays.org. And um, in this case, I use three magical helper functions. One just generates a Unix subject, one actually sends a mail, and one checks if a user has mail. Of course, this is, this is not really um, usable in a cloud scenario where everything is separated, but in my case, um, I'm speaking of a single machine right now. So you could, uh, this is really frightening. Um, you could just, just feed in, I don't know, like, like the sender, the receiver, the recipient, uh, the subject that it generated, and then you check, does the user Toshi, which is by intent the same in this case because it's a local user account, uh, does it have a mail from Warner at localhost with this subject? Um, I don't think I have to highlight that the subject is um, the thing with which I distinguish this test mail from ordinary mail. So this is really a live test, and I'm really um, I'm running it productively, and it seems to work just nicely. But the thing is, um, oh yeah, and I'm using uh, Herlu Mail X to, to, to send and to receive, to check if the mail has arrived. The thing is, who wants to copy and paste this all over? This is cumbersome, this sucks. And there must be a better way. Well, yes, but this guy is actually a former colleague of mine. And when I tweeted about it, this was his reply. Bash and generation in one sentence makes me frightened. And I said, hmm, I smell a challenge here. So if you are into, I don't know, uh, BDSM or abuse of programming languages, this is your slide. What we're going to do is we're going to use a for loop. Ooh, how, how innovative. And, and, and simply iterate over the recipient addresses. And then we're going to use the evil 
evil, 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 to dynamically define a test function for each recipient address. So, so before I just statically coded them down, and now I'm just going to evil them as, as required. Um, there's only a problem. When Roundup, as I said, Roundup doesn't, doesn't um, uh, Roundup actually does two things. Uh, it doesn't only source your script. First of all, it grabs your script, so, and it simply grabs for this it prefix. So basically the reasoning why they use this it prefix is so that Roundup can distinguish between a test function and, for example, a helper function. So if it grabs the test plan, it won't find these dynamically defined functions. Well, that's not really a problem, because Roundup also sources the file, so we can simply ex ex expand this, um, this internal variable ourselves. And then that would look something like this. So here I go with my, I don't know, whatever res uh, recipient addresses I want to check. I added Trostan.bavani, extra points to me if I wrote it correctly. Um, and then I, I simply evil right, my, my test function here. And here we go and simply append um, this test function I defined up here and just append it at the end of Roundup plan and this works. But we might end up in hell for this. It's not nice, it's, it's really bash abuse. And, and, and There is actually an alternative if we combine Roundup with Ansible. So how do we combine Roundup with Ansible? Second meme. Um, first approach, so there's four approaches um, I'm, I'm showing right here because I'm still not really, really um, sure which one is the best. And actually, which approach is the best, of course, might um, we might have different reasons about uh, uh, opinions about that. So in the first approach, I, which I call just total independence, you just run your Ansible deploy book, and somehow you deploy those Roundup tests on your target system. And if you want to test, well, you just SSH in, and you want run Roundup manually to test the installation. You can potentially do that. I don't know, like like every day or whatever, or automated. I don't care. Point here is running Ansible and running Roundup tests is separated. Which is, of course, a bonus if you are not too sure of using Ansible in the long term. Maybe you're not sure which conflict management solution is the right one. And you can run, run the tests whenever you want, because they are on the, on the installed system. But, of course, the lazy admin forgets and omits. And we are lazy, so you might just forget to SSH in and run the tests. And the thing is, if you run such a test, uh, such a system test, it might be that there is sensitive data that you need to put in. For example, if I want to, to test if user uh, Toshi can we log in, I will actually need his clear text password. Because uh, I can't feed MailX and, I don't know, uh, uh, a hash of his password to, to, to feed that to test the login. So if I want to test that, and it's perfectly OK if you say, no, 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 that's not something I want to test because it's sensitive data. But if I want to test it, I would have to put in the, the, the password in clear text. And then, of course, it's really buggy, uh, ugly bash abuse, what I showed you beforehand. Second approach is um, let me help you. Ansible does some stuff. In this case, I just use Ansible to push the Roundup tests onto the, uh, the system with the async module or whatever. And I also let Ansible trigger running um, Roundup which solves for the problem with, with the laziness, because every time I run my playbook, I automatically run my Roundup tests. Um, this still means I can run, run my Roundup tests independently from, from <coughs> deploying, so I can always, I don't know, some auditor could log in and, 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 and run the tests. But we still have the problem with um, the sensitive data, and it's still ugly bash abuse, right? Because we're still assuming that we're using the ugly bash script I showed you beforehand. So, third approach, which goes again one step ahead, um, is um, I use Ansible to deploy the scripts onto the installed system, to run them, but also to delete them afterwards. Which means, if I have sensitive data in it, it's no longer permanently lingering around on the installed system. Yeah. Of course, this is a compromise. You s you s it's still perfectly okay if you say, no, 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 no. I don't want my perfect data, uh, my, my sensitive data to, to linger around, even if it's just for a minute. It's perfectly okay. We can have different opinions about that. But at least I feel a bit better because it's not ling no longer lingering around permanently. Of course, you would uh, 
change mod 0600, uh, 0700, your, your test scripts or whatever, and so only Wood can read them or whatever, but so this is a way. Still leaves me with a problem. Oh, a new problem. Now, because I delete them afterwards, I cannot run Roundup on the installed system itself manually anymore. Well, okay, I can live with that. But we still have the ugly bash abuse, but seeing that we now use Ansible anyway, so we really married Ansible and Roundup together, we can actually use uh, uh, um, its powers to the, to the full extent, and I call this build to order, um, meaning I, 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 just don't, I, I don't just async the changes over, but I use the Ansible template module. And if I use Ansible template module, I can use the for loop provided by Jinja, and I don't have to do ugly bash abuse anymore. We still have the disadvantage that the O's are now really married together, and even, even worse, if you want, um, the one of tests are now really entwined with this particular contract management solution, but, pff, well, I think that's sort of a cosmetical argument. Well, I currently go with the fourth approach, um, but as always, your millage may, uh, may, may vary, of course, so you can have different opinions about that. Um, another thing about running Roundup within Ansible, winners use roles. Uh, I think the Ansible documentation somewhere says something like that as well, uh, and rightfully. Um, of course, I'm not going to repeat my, 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 my Roundup running all the time again, copy and pasting it into a playbook. I'm using a role for that, of course. And the way I want to use that role is, well, it's just non ary role. Um, I tell it where my tests are living. This is actually now a directory of XXX tests uh, dot sh dot j2 files because as I said I'm, I'm templating them now so I can use ginger magic if, if desired and this I simply put uh, into my files directory or whatever way you like it um, I also introduced this pre-install packages because um, in this case of a mail server uh, finally mail x wasn't installed by default well if you need some extra packages just for testing I thought it would be nice if I could just uh, tell the world to do it and, and, and not, not to have an explicit um, task for that in every package. Yeah, in this example, for example, this is a uh, Hello Mail X um, that's really small and I can perfectly live uh, with that lingering around on the mail server. It's not like, I don't know, GCC or something potentially really bad. So this is how, how I actually uh, use the world right now. And um, yeah, what, what does the world do? Nothing, nothing magic. Uh, it downloads the shell script with the get URL module, installs the pre-installed packages, and creates a temporary directory for the tests because, because those are template tests. Um, and because I want to clean up afterwards, I simply use a temporary directory. So nothing, um, nothing magic. Then this is what it looks like. Nothing magic, as I said. Um, somebody would probably argue, well, what uh, if, the, if, if GitHub is down? Well, then you don't l download from GitHub, but from some other location. And I trans transfer my tests. And with an Ansible, if a test fails, it looks like this. Um, I get the standard out from, from Roundup rather nicely. For example, in this case, uh, my firewall um, um, Either I, uh, there's a port open that I didn't configure, or a port is not open that I uh, was configuring. And I can see quite nicely, um, well, the test output and the test that failed. And um, that's basically it. One small gotcha, though. Um, if you think this is a good idea, you are probably also using tags, because you don't want the complete entire playbook to, to run. And if you do use tags, uh, because Roundup is just another role, you would, of course, have to include Roundup in your minus minus text um, argument on the command line, or just take the Roundup role with all text that you use otherwise. Right? Otherwise, you would break um, the thing with, uh, we want to, round, to run Roundup every time we have deployed. <laughs> yep. And another gotcha, this role, well, it's not available at Ansible Galaxy, and I'm actually, I'm, I'm quite hesitant um, if I listen to uh, JP all the time uh, saying bad things about Galaxy. 
And I'm not even sure if it's really worth making it available, but if someone wants it, I, will, I would make it available. And that's it. Questions? <laughs> oh, oh, much too early. Let me ask, uh, uh, um, oh, okay, question? Yeah. If I compared them, yeah. yeah, I did it on the slide. There was a small compare. Um, do 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 do. Here was a comparison of of of, of features. I just looked um, superficially on them, because I myself had no reason to try them in detail. But if you go to this page, he he does have some more details on that. Okay. So who of you? Oh, okay. It seems like you're testing in a way the playbooks and in a way at the same time you're validating the setup of the server. So let me rephrase that. So you want to test whether your playbook is, works correctly, but most of the time I would do that in, in the logic of the topic management system. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, mm -hmm. do step, you check the step, you do the step, and there's a lot of logic. There. And then there's another way of saying, okay, the search has been set up by the role. By whatever. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. And now I'm auditing to see whether it's still compliant. Yeah. But that again would require to rerun the playbook and see whether there are any changes. So it, it kind of puzzles me what you're really testing. Because if you're testing whether the email logic works, why do you do that on the whole server, not just on the logic? Of because that was my point about intent. Things I forget in my playbook are not tested by Ansible automatically. They wouldn't fail because I didn't tell Ansible to do those things. Sure. And, and if I, if I um, think about writing tests, at least I myself noticed, um, and it's also my experience from, from Python programming, if, if you write the test first, um, it's, it's way harder to miss details. Then, if I if you begin with the implementation first, and in my, in my view, a playbook is basically an implementation of your intent. It depends how you start training. Yes. 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 And then yes. Implement it. Yes. And uh, and on the on the other hand, of course, um, what you are testing depends on the test you're writing, right? In, in in my example, what I care about actually is about is the fucking main server working now, and can I finally switch over or not? Because a certain shit button W uh, ISP is unable to to run my server properly, so um, it it wasn't enough for me to see a, 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 a playbook running. Um, I had more concerns than that. For example, the integration. And um, I don't know, is Ton here? Ton, ah, Ton is here, right? Um, so I assume you're you're going to talk about role testing. And I'm, I, 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 I blindly assume that you're really restricted to testing a single role only, right? So if I want to, to, to test the outcome, the integration of, of, of the outcome of different roles, I have to go this way, right? right? So that's what I would pri primarily, of course, advocate this for. Yeah, with our experience as well, just yeah. you know, one playbook that yeah. we did in the test. Yeah. And, and the, thing is, the thing is, those one-up tests, they run so incredibly fast. Not that I'm bashing against the execution speed of Ansible, that's not the point. But, and they are also, well, they were independent of Ansible. I'm using some, some, some Jinja templating right now, but I can live with that. Right? Um, so it just gives you another layer of confidence, that's basically all. And um, I actually, I don't know, I, I had a tweet actually about it, because I actually noticed, well, my playbook looked perfectly fine, but I just forget something. And when I ran the test, it showed me. So basically, that's, it's, it's, it's simply an argument as to um, it's not much work to write those tests. It's not um, that you have to install a complete Python stack or whatever on, on the installed system. Um, that's why I would simply advocate for, for doing this. It's not uh, maybe not the final solution about with the secret stuff and the credentials. As I said, we can discuss about that, of course. right? In, in my case, it's really just my own simple server, so I don't care about if my mail server password temporarily goes into a test script, and, and, and because I'm more concerned with... Um, here's, here's a... Um, well, it's not Friday, but uh, let's call it uh, um, a Saturday confession. I don't do monitoring. 
Because every time I looked at monitoring, that's another parallel with, with, with Jan Piet uh, until he discovered Cebix. Every time I looked at monitoring, it was like, oh, what the fuck? This kind of, of, of you know, like, like, like setup and, and, and time it would take me to set this up and also to keep it running, uh, just to be notified if my, if my mail server is not working anymore. I'm seriously considering simply running the roundup tests every night that would eventually tell me that, hmm, something is broken here. It's not the same, of course, but as I said, um, I'm just a dev with some simple needs, and this is not a cloud talk. Yeah, that's, that's why I had my um, introduction in slides in here. Yeah, other questions? No? Oh, uh, yes? Yeah. yeah. Remark, uh, so you, you test the, the end result of, of your... Of that's, my, that's my personal intent, yes. But, yeah. but nothing says that you have to do that too. But you can write the test any way you want. What you want to know is whether the service that you have set up is available to users. For example, for example. The server itself, you cannot, you cannot test that. Because well, I, can, I, I cannot test the network to the server, yes. But I can. Yes, these particular tests, yes. But for example, the test is uh, is Postfix running at all? I can't obviously not execute from outside. Postfix running at all? I think that's a bad example. No, it's just the first. It's just the first basic check. Well, you have written in your playbook uh, service yes. Postfix. Yes. Running. You will have to test that anymore. Well. Uh, no, we just similar way we run as we have the actual. Yes, but 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 think about um, services. Maybe a better example. Think about another Ansible module. I mean, I said we we can rely on the fact that those modules have been tested. Take that with a grain of salt. Expliciting testing that the module really does what we intended it to do. If it doesn't take too much time for me to write such <coughs> a test, well, it comes for free. So why not do it? If you don't trust modules and, and actions as they are written now or as they are supposed to work, then I prefer you add more tests to a testing framework for those modules. Yes, but as I said, it's not necessarily the module that is wrong. Maybe it was just me. Yeah, yeah. For, take for example, you had a very good example, um, Ginger. My playbook looks perfectly right and I feed some data in it. And because of Ginger properties, what was the example again? I think this string, yeah. 1,024 key B or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> take this for example. Um, you could have possibly, maybe, I'm, I'm not sure, but, but I guess you could have caught it with, with such a roundup test. Yeah. And you wouldn't catch it with, with, with the playbook uh, test or with, an, with a role test, unless you add an explicit test case for it. So I still, I still think it, it adds some value and it comes for free. So why not? Maybe to respond to yeah. There's, um, I think the service check is maybe what tells us whether it's running to the user. But these kind of tests would complement it in case it doesn't work. You have like a deeper layer of development. What is important? What is important? So it gives you two layers to look at. One is important for the user. But if you start debugging, you run these tests, you will see, ah, oh, it's here. Maybe the permission is wrong for that. Is Exactly. It, it exactly. And, and how often have we debugged something? And it was some really stupid shit. For example, with a post fix, I don't know, the change would didn't get set up correctly. How often have we been bitten by that, for example? Yeah. So what we do for well, at Cisco is we run big scenarios with switches, virtual machines, everything. And at the very end, we run very specific end to end tests, so mm -hmm. functional tests. Yeah. Can I ping from this machine to that machine that can yeah. only work if all of these pieces eventually fit together. And that's on top of, obviously, all yep. the tests after we do stuff. So. And, and that makes it, yeah. But, but, but how do you write them? Do you write them inside the playbook? Or is it a best script? Inside of the playbook at the okay. very end. Okay. Just before we send out the mail, yep. everything works. Yep. <laughs> yep. This is the last step in the playbook. Yep. Uh, no, it's, a, play. it's perfectly fine to do that, but um, it's not an argument before or against. No, but, no, no, no. but for example, if I see this, um, well, I'm not going to argue about line count, but depending on what you're doing, the, the Ansible playbook variant would be way longer. Because, of course, the bash is perfect at just running executables. Um, and at a certain point, of course, we, we can all come up with examples when, when the bash is not sufficient anymore. Right? I think the downside from 
as a system in writing this yep. text is easy, mm -hmm. but um, with config management, we extracted a lot of the tests and logic away. So with one command, we can see whether a package is installed or all that stuff. And here you're kind of sometimes re implementing parts of those texts. Yep. Or if I, you want to share your Postman. Um, the postfix yeah. macros, is that, yeah, yeah. To me, like yeah. How would we share that? Like, you, know, you run the test, we run the test. So the sharing aspect kind of goes away when you put it back into the playbook or some logic. It comes back. It's not that yeah. you can't. Yeah. yeah. It is limited. Yeah. 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 And that's why all the frameworks in the shell kind of they, they don't have this kind of they didn't go over the concept of having a shared way of libraries by one for code and one for this. Okay. And yeah. that kind of gets them limited. Yeah. Sharing of that kind of thing yeah. is very difficult because your setup fits the library. Sure. Because yeah. the logic for a certain thing is different. It's so often again and yeah. the same. So yeah. having to find the exact yeah. I'm also seeing this a very, very limited use the moment you go to the cloud or you go to multi-system whatever. That's not what this is really about, right? Okay. Thank you very much.